The subject of enhancing uh, human performance in a military context is something that has interested me for a number of years. And, and given my current uh, position, is something that I'm very implicated in uh, from a strategic perspective. And moreover, given last week's uh, defense policy announcement, we, we now have government intent and policy top cover uh, to get on with many of the initiatives that we hope to push within uh, Military Personnel Command. Uh, but before I start, it's important to recognize a, a number of individuals here. And as mentioned, uh, Lieutenant General Whitecross was my boss up until uh, just over two months ago. So she is well placed to, uh, to grade my homework. Um, Major General Simon Hetherington uh, recently uh, taken command of uh, Canadian Army Doctrine and Training Center. Simon has replaced me in four jobs in the last 10 years, including Brigade and Division Command, exchange with 18th Airborne Corps, and uh, in command in Afghanistan. But for some reason, he didn't follow me into this job here. Uh, I don't know if that says anything or not. Um, it's great to see the, uh, the partnership with uh, NATO, Defense Unit, or NATO Defense College, Queens, uh, CAT-TC, and, uh, and the U.S. Army War College. Now, being a proud alumni of the U.S. Army War College, I'm very happy to see this level of collaboration and your participation here. So the, uh, the theme of enhancing military performance is very timely for us in the Canadian Armed Forces. Military capability is based on the, or is built on the strength of its, its people. You can have the best equipment money can buy, but if you don't have the right people to, uh, to man it, um, it's going to be useless. Now, history is rife with examples of poorly armed, uh, but highly motivated uh, forces overcoming much stronger adversaries. You know, don't get me wrong, we, we still need to invest in the, uh, the best um, hardware and force structure out there. Uh, but one could argue over the course of recent history in the Canadian Armed Forces, we've privileged that aspect of capability development over our people. Now, that being said, you would be hard pressed uh, to find a large organization in this country that puts more effort into looking after its people uh, than, than the Canadian Armed Forces. Most of our men and women in uniform um, and their families are stronger because of their service. They grow because of their experiences. Uh, they become better armed to withstand life stressors and they lead better lives for it. Um, and that's not to say it happens to everybody and we've got to make sure we've got the uh, programs in place to look after those who don't. But unfortunately, there's a toxic narrative out there that if you join the Canadian Forces, if you make it through our recruiting system, um, you will become ill and injured, you'll develop PTSD, you'll be sexually assaulted, you'll have a rough transition out, and you'll end up on the street. And that, uh, that narrative is, uh, is constantly reinforced by uh, uh, the media stories out there. You know, while these do happen, and we've got to uh, put in place measures as best we can to ensure they don't happen, the fact of the matter is most of us who serve are, are okay. And the archetype of the disturbed veteran is not as common as Hollywood or, or the media would make it out uh, to be or lead one to believe. So the danger is uh, to our national security that this could be an existential threat as we uh, take a look down the road. Now, paradoxically, as our nation's population grows, our traditional recruiting pool becomes smaller and smaller. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that a little bit later. But if we can't recruit beyond our, our traditional base, we're going to have a very, very hard time filling our ranks. Um, so we've got to do everything we can to keep up with societal changes, to modernize our personnel system to address gaps and shortfalls, uh, to provide our members the tools uh, to better grow and thrive as part of their military service, and most importantly, to uh, optimize their individual performance so that we continue, can continue to deliver operational excellence as part of our output. Now, it's very interesting that the government chose to put people as the first chapter of the uh, defense policy. It wasn't like that in earlier iterations, but it sends a, uh, a clear message where they want us to put our effort. Now, if you haven't read the defense policy, it is loaded with uh, initiatives. Uh, especially on the personnel side, 
Now, fortunately, many of them we've already begun or are about to begin, but, or begin, but there's a huge amount of work in, in front of us. So I guess my key message for you is going to be that the Canadian Armed Forces is, is undertaking significant uh, changes in personal management policies in order to be a force that uh, delivers institutional and operational excellence uh, from now and into the future and whose people thrive uh, during and after their service. Now to help me here, we've got a number of uh, members of Military Personnel Command. I'd just like you to put up your hands who's part of Military Personnel Command here. Hey, don't be shy, don't be shy. And also don't be surprised if I call you out during the rest of my talk here. Uh, this isn't a test. <laughs> now before I get into uh, some specifics of the initiatives we're talking about, I wanna, I wanna talk about some of the drivers for change and, and why we have to do this. And really what we're facing is a confluence of, of individual, organizational and societal uh, stressors and drivers that are, are um, making it absolutely necessary we change the way we do business. And within the Canadian Armed Forces, we are very well served by the defense scientists of a Director General of Military Personnel Research and Analysis, uh, whose reports much of what I'm gonna talk about are based on. Uh, to put it in military jargon, there are uh, strategic J2 uh, on a or for a, from a human resources perspective, if you will. So our population out there is not as prepared for military service as it once was. Uh, potential recruits have lower entry level fitness, they have less developed coping skills, and they're more likely to have been medicated as children. With one in five Canadians uh, suffering from, a, uh, from mental health issues, this statistic is likewise reflected in our pool of potential recruits. There have been many studies on millennials in, in the workforce out there. You know, from wanting different uh, uh, careers throughout their lives and flexibility with their current career, uh, to having more uh, frequent and personalized uh, performance feedback, uh, to an emotional and I dare say a physiological attachment to their electronic devices and having two teenagers at home, I can see that in spades. Um, a, more, uh, a more balanced desire for work-life balance um, our new generation is demanding a more evolved personnel system. And the face of Canada is uh, changing as well, and we must change accordingly. Uh, you take a look at this room, it doesn't reflect what's out there with the Canadian population. As of 2015, one in five Canadians was a visible minority, and by 2031, that's going to be one in three. Now, currently in the armed forces, we're sitting at only 7.5% visible minorities. And if you include our indigenous peoples, that, that goes up to uh, just under 10%. So we have a ways to go. Now, we're also seeing increased challenges within our ranks. 2013-2014, um, the Surgeon General had a uh, health and lifestyle information survey, which portrayed some troubling results. Now, even though the number who classified themselves as physically active increased from the previous study five years before, uh, so did the amount of time they spent on sedentary activities, at work uh, sitting for five hours a day, uh, spending much more time in front of computer screens or televisions and the like. Now, it's based on self-reported data. 25% were classified as obese, with almost three-quarters of the force uh, classified as overweight according to BMI calculations. Now, I know there's controversy with BMI and the like, but it's still an indicator. Now, more positively, uh, I was going through last year's uh, fitness results. We brought in a new fitness test called the force, force test, part of which is a girth measurement. Um, and positively, our, our girth size is somewhat smaller than the average Canadians. And likewise, our predicted VO2 max is uh, significantly higher. Uh, so that's, that's good. However, on the other side, uh, going back to the survey, uh, less than a third reporting, reported eating uh, six servings of fruit and vegetables a day, you know, a strong indicator of, of poor nutrition. On the injury side, with the same uh, survey, 44.4% reported an acute or repetitive strain injury over the course of the last year. Um, and over two-thirds reported engaging in unsafe training practices, uh, most likely during physical training. 
Now this corresponds to our rates of medical releases where almost 50% are due to MSK or musculoskeletal uh, injuries. And our sense is, although we don't have the data yet to back it up, that most of these are preventable. Mental health also continues to be a focus area. Uh, the survey indicated 17% had sought uh, uh, um, of Reg Force members and consulted a medical health professional during their career, and 7.6 percent had uh, had major or had suffered from major depression. You know, stress levels in general and, and workplace stress in particular are uh, are on the rise throughout our society, and our military is no different. Sleep is, is one area that needs uh, a lot more study, and we continue to uh, learn a lot about it. And if the experiences of our allies and uh, studies in the civilian world are any indicator, uh, we are sleep deprived and we exercise poor sleep hygiene. And more study there is going to happen. At the organizational level, we still have a number of challenges to uh, overcome. Although we have made much progress, uh, harmful and inappropriate sexual behavior uh, must continue to be eliminated. The results of last year's StatsCan survey were, were disturbing. Um, and clearly making the rationale for continued focus on Operation Our Honor. You know, despite whatever progress we may have made, we've got to keep our eye on the ball here and ensure that uh, we have a workplace characterized by mutual respect and dignity. Otherwise, we're just not going to be able to attract uh, those great Canadians that we need to bring into our workforce. Now there's a whole bunch of other challenges out there, ranging from older recruits and individuals staying in the workforce longer, uh, addictions, uh, family stresses compounded by military service, but, but you get the picture. You know, in the battle for talent, if we don't change uh, the way we do business, we're gonna lose. So what are we doing about it? Well, lots. And I could spend several hours talking about the range of initiatives that we've got uh, going on, but uh, I want to save some of those for, for question period. Um, but let me talk about a couple of big ones. Um, so at the highest level in the department, we're aiming to take a much more preventative uh, approach. One of the uh, core elements of the defense policy was a concept called the total health and wellness strategy. Now this is going to be an umbrella strategy that, uh, that brings together a number of disparate yet mutually supporting uh, subordinate strategies, programs, and initiatives. Now while there's going to be an injection of uh, resources to, to assist the clinical aspect and the treatment aspect, there's going to be a lot of focus on the, uh, the preventative piece. Uh, so it's going to be an all-inclusive, comprehensive approach to care uh, with a big focus on, on psychological well-being in the workplace, the physical work environment, and personal health, including the physical, mental, spiritual, and family uh, aspects of members' uh, lives. Um, for those of you in the Army, you are well familiar with the Canadian Army Integrated Performance Strategy, which was initiated here in Kingston in, in CAT-TC. Uh, so this is the Armed Forces manifestation of a great initiative that had started in the Army. It's a way to get our arms wrapped around and integrate uh, a bunch of great programs. Now there's, there's a whole bunch of planned components to uh, total health and wellness, but I'm just going to touch on a number of them here. Now firstly, we're revising the Canadian Forces uh, Fitness Strategy, um, which we've rescoped uh, to, to incorporate the triad of physical activity, sleep, nutrition, uh, for those of you in the U.S. Army, you'll recognize the Performance Triad, which has recently been uh, adopted by the Canadian Army. But we're also going to add injury prevention. Um, we're still in the early days of, of developing this strategy, and I can say because I, I chair the committee that, uh, that develops it. We've already got in place a, a pretty good tool to measure success. As part of our new fitness uh, test, uh, the force test, we've, uh, uh, we've uh, got an electronic platform. Um, that allows commanders to see aggregate scores of subordinate units, uh, see trends, uh, where, where they're improving, where they're not doing so well. And it's a tool to help hold uh, the chain of command accountable. We're in the process of uh, developing desired outcomes in terms of daily physical activity, nutrition, and, and sleep. We're learning much more every day, and, uh, and Pete touched on the impact of the brain. 
So the impact of daily physical activity on the brain is something that we can't uh, underestimate. How, just out of curiosity, how many have read the book Spark out there by John Ratty? Anybody? Well, the uh, a number of you, good. A great book that talks about how daily physical activity uh, is, is essential for, for brain development, uh, memory retention, ability to withstand stress, uh, uh, creativity, a whole host of areas that we've got to get much better at. So that's going to be a core component of, of the strategy. We've got some pretty good uh, programs for injury prevention, uh, but the challenge is tracking and holding the chain of command accountable for, for unsafe training practices, especially during physical training. We're currently looking at how to better conduct injury surveillance with health services um, and be able to determine trends by units. And one of the principles uh, of this new strategy, uh, strategy has got to be progressive training, both at the front end of uh, entry level uh, as part of the career, and also post-injury. So you're not thrown right back into it, expected to keep up with the rest of your unit. We've got to be smart about it and stop breaking so many people. So on the, uh, the subject of health services, uh, the next piece, or next key, next key piece is the Surgeon General's Integrated Health Strategy, uh, which, with which we're going to modernize our, uh, our health care delivery, um, both across the country uh, and, and overseas. Uh, but there's a significant preventative aspect to it. Now, as I said before, there's going to be a resource uh, injection, uh, and defense policy talked about that. Um, it's going to aim to focus on a triad of responsibility. Uh, so the individual and his or her family, uh, the chain of command, and uh, the, uh, the health services. Um, it's going to look at governance. You know, last time we looked at governance was part of RX2000, almost uh, two decades ago. It's going to look at investing in a digital health environment uh, where we can do much better business intelligence, determine trends, and, and where we need to focus uh, based on the injuries that are occurring. Subordinate to this is uh, the mental health strategy. Now, the first one was published in 2013. It has done quite well, uh, made significant advances in the way we address uh, mental health injuries. You know, fight, despite the media stories out there, the, the men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces have significantly better access and, and shorter wait times to, uh, uh, to clinicians than those served by the provincial health uh, care systems. You know, a great success story is the Road to Mental Readiness, or R2MR, um, put together by Lieutenant Colonel Suzanne Bailey, just in the back here, uh, who, if I can use the word, uh, was the architect of, uh, of this program. Great success, and I'm not going to steal too much of her thunder because she is a panel member uh, tomorrow. Um, but this has been adopted across the, uh, across the armed forces. Um, I think there's about 30 police services across the country that, that have taken it up along with a number of first responders. More to go um, in terms of, of, of weaving it into the daily fabric, or the daily lifestyle of our, our members, uh, and more initiatives to come, but it is a success story. So more to follow on that one. Now changing gears a bit here, our Surgeon General is putting out a spiritual resilience strategy uh, called to serve uh, 2.0. And I know we've got a number of uh, chaplains in the audience here and, uh, and uh, Major Harry Crawford is gonna speak tomorrow uh, so we can speak some more about this. But it really talks about increasing the effectiveness of uh, the Canadian Armed Forces uh, by supporting the spiritual and um, moral well-being of military <coughs> personnel. Um, engaging in a transcendent purpose, if, if you will, having a purpose bigger than oneself. Anyone who has read any of Daniel Pink's work on Drive knows that that's one of the three uh, key elements of, of motivation. And you can't have much more of a, of a transcendent purpose than serving one's country in the armed forces. Um, we're also putting the final touches on a joint uh, Canadian Armed Forces Veterans Affairs Canada uh, suicide prevention strategy. Now being fully cognizant that there is no one silver bullet for suicide prevention, and anybody that tells you that there is uh, doesn't know what they're talking about, what we're bringing in is a layered defense uh, to address as many of the, uh, uh, of the uh, risk factors as we can in, in tandem while giving our soldiers and leaders the tools to look after themselves and each other. Uh, but we hope for an announcement on this uh, sometime in the early fall, 
uh, with action plans to, uh, to follow up rapidly. Uh, there will be a number of, uh, of additional tools that we'll be putting in place, uh, such as a suicide ideation uh, protocol. You know, what happens in your unit uh, when, uh, when somebody uh, threatens, threatens self-harm? Uh, some units have got some great programs, others not. We want to standardize that across the Canadian forces. Same with the post-vention uh, protocol, uh, making sure that is standardized. Change gears here again. So earlier I mentioned the, uh, the changing face of Canada. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces is moving beyond the uh, traditional compliance-based model of uh, diversity and adopting more of a, uh, a values-based model as we implement the uh, Canadian Armed Forces uh, diversity strategy. And I got to give a shout out over there to Lieutenant Colonel Sarah Hare, who is our director. Sarah, put up your hand over there so everybody can see you. Who is our director of human rights and diversity. <coughs> who again is going to be on a panel tomorrow, so I'm not going to steal too much of her thunder. But this involves a pretty uh, intense effort to, uh, to take a look at all, all of our policies, uh, you know, ranging from career management, recruiting, education, awareness, spiritual support, and other key areas across the Canadian Forces to making sure that we reflect the needs of the new Canada. Now there's a whole host of other initiatives under the umbrella of uh, Total Health and Wellness. Uh, such as Op Honor, uh, Integrated Complaint and Conflict Management System, and a Comprehensive Family Support System. But uh, you realize I can go on for some time about this. But I want to change gears a little bit and talk about how we're aspiring to change the conditions of service uh, to make sure we, we better meet the needs of a changing society. Now we currently have a personnel management system that is rooted in the post-Korean War 1950s time frame industrial age, if you will. And we've got to take a much more personalized, individual approach to how we manage our people, again, to be able to retain the right, uh, right skill sets. We've begun a, a significant initiative called The Journey, which uh, aims to look at all aspects of a career path from the, from the perspective of an individual. Uh, and again, aims to have a much more customized uh, approach. You know, led by a, a, a two-star, uh, who's also going to be responsible for integrating and, and overseeing the implementation of all of our defense policy personnel initiatives. Uh, the journey by itself has a lot of new ideas in it. You know, probably the most far-reaching is to make the transition between full and part-time service much more permeable, much more seamless. You know, I mentioned before the desire of the millennials to have many careers in their lifetimes. You know, if they want to have six or seven careers, why don't we make three or four of those the military so they can transition in and out very easily as they come back in, take advantage of the, uh, the skills and experiences they've gained and take into consideration we look at progression uh, for that. Uh, this is very aspirational and it's going to take uh, a lot of study uh, to put in place or so under no uh, illusions about the amount of work this is going to take. But likewise, um, geographic stability is a common complaint especially from family members. So as part of this, we're looking at uh, how do we do uh, restricted and non-restricted service where a member can choose to stay in one location uh, for as long as desired. Now, of course, there's going to be uh, career progression impacts and, uh, and compensation and the like, and this is not going to be easy. And at the end of the day, we have to assure, assure our operational output continues that we can put the right people uh, at the right place for the right operation, or for the right, on the right operations to deliver that excellence that the government expects. So what, uh, let me talk a little bit about implementation here. So much of what I've discussed is going to entail some significant uh, individual behavioral change, um, which is difficult even if it's in their best interests. Now through uh, behavioral economics or the emerging science of behavioral insights, there's been uh, much learned on how people actually make decisions and how we can nudge them uh, to make uh, better ones. There was an interesting article in The Economist several weeks uh, ago that talked about how many governments across the, uh, the Western world are bringing in behavioral insights teams to uh, help with the implementation of public policy. Our own government has done this with the PCO Innovation Hub, and we've engaged them on, uh, um, on improving our recruiting system, uh, and they gave us a, a very good report, and uh, very soon, in the coming weeks, they're going to help us out with the, uh, the fitness strategy, 
and taking a look at behavioral insights and how we can impact human behavior there. We've come to realize, though, that they may not have the capacity uh, to help us with everything we want to change. Uh, so very recently, we've staffed a proposal to, uh, to build our own uh, Canadian Forces Behavioral Insights team. And so very exciting stuff. And this is, uh, uh, this is very pre-decisional, but it's where I think we want to go. So I've covered a lot of ground here, uh, and there are numerous initiatives that I haven't even touched on. But I want to leave you with my key message that we are undertaking significant change in the way we look after and manage our people. But this is complex stuff. Now, given that the defense policy was just announced last week, and even though we had a hand in shaping it and, uh, and helping with the various versions of various drafts, um, we're in the process of doing our mission analysis and troops to task estimate uh, to be able to rack and stack and phase these initiatives as we, as we work on them. Uh, so with that, uh, I look forward to any questions on what we're doing. Thank you.